Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 283, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Dave Shelley and Laura Bowen. In this part of the interview, we talk more about the Gold Box series, uh, some of the stuff that happened after the Gold Box series, including uh, Dark Sun, and uh, some other projects, and ultimately what happened to SSI and why they shut their doors. And uh, we wrap up talking a little bit more about the Seven Dragons Saga project, as you know, this was recorded back in September of last year, so obviously there's been some uh, pretty big developments that we'll talk about, or that I'll talk about after this. But anyway, I kept it in because it's pretty interesting to me kind of reveal some of the uh, logic uh, of what we're seeing now. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Dave Shelley and Laura Bowen. Uh, so I was, you know, I always got these games for my birthdays or uh, for Christmas. You know, one of the things I loved even before... Uh, playing the game was just going through all the different materials and you know, nice manuals and you know the journals are really fun. I guess you're not supposed to just read through them, right? But <laughs> you know, yeah, everybody does. Oh, of course. Uh, so, you, you know, do you think something's been lost with that sort of thing now? Well, all the digital downloads. It's sort yeah, of with everything, on this. it feels a little more disposable in its way. I mean, there's still you know, games are still spectacular and uh, engaging, but. Uh, there was certainly something to be said for having that physical object with all of its contents. I mean, even if you get a physical game now, like a console game, you're lucky to get an eight-page manual that says, just, you know, check the website, check the wikis. <laughs> and we used to make really good money with um, the uh, stra strategy guides. Oh, yeah, those are great. I think I got a couple here. But, uh, yeah, that was the thing. I'd get the games, and then right when I got the game, I'd get the, uh, the clue book, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah. You'd miss out a lot of content if you didn't have the clue book, right? Yeah, I mean, it uh, explained the backgrounds of everything and essentially laid out. Oh, here's one. Yeah, Secret of the Silver Blades clue book. Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, that's really... it oh yeah. <laughs> Remember these? <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic oh. stuff. I think I wrote a few of them. I can't remember. Um, oh, you wrote the the clue books? I, yeah, I think I uh, before we had we had some dedicated writers later on. Yeah, written but... by Dave Shelley. Oh, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Mancuso and Ken Humphreys. Ken Humphreys, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was producer of uh, Pools of Darkness too. Yeah. So, what's your favorite gold box game? Oh. Uh, I like Secret of the Silver Blades because it was the first time that I was in charge of everything. <laughs> so I, I have a, you know, a very selfish reason for why I like it. <laughs> it's uh, these games you have to work on. I mean, there were some serious challenges with that, especially with the design. Uh, sales was initially thinking that uh, we could cut down our costs of development by uh, just doing essentially uh, a dungeon hunt, you know, just hack monsters all day. Uh, and skip on the storyline and skip on all that. This is why sales and marketing should not be. <laughs> no, they have never. Uh, but yes, yeah. uh, wow. they have found enough information from their distributors and such to rescind that instruction. <laughs> <laughs> so when was this one made? Let's see the year on here. Remember when uh, Secret of the Silver Blades came out? Well, let's, let's see. Probably ninety. This is the IBM. It says here 1990. Okay, could have been 90. Because, okay. yeah. yeah, I was hired in 89. I definitely worked on that. Yeah, and Goldbox was going in yeah. 1989. The development cycle wasn't that long. It was a lot shorter than games are these well, days. Pool of, uh, Pool of Radiance was a little over a year. The last three months, incredibly long hours as we tried to get out. <laughs> yeah, pressure. Uh, with Curse the Azure Bonds, we moved to a nine month development cycle. Uh, and since we had an established engine, even uh, if uh, adding in the spells and the additional levels, especially with Curse, was <laughs> proved a little less easy. Than <laughs> a lot of people, this is their favorite Curse of the Azure Bonds. Yeah, I can you know, it's got that really cool story. It did tattoos. 
Not even if we get the novel, the novels for these games. You ever read those? Maybe even I wrote them. I don't. No, we had the TSR guys wrote them, oh, okay. uh, and we just provided them in the box and such. Oh, the same guys who were doing the Dragonlance. No, different guys. Or, okay, um, yeah. I don't, different. don't remember who hired who we hired to do it, but yeah, they just we just asked for uh, a novel and they provided one. I guess yeah. the sales of all these gold box games were, were nice, right? Were there any that are disappointed? Oh, well, I mean, not until toward the um, end. I mean, all of our internal ones did very well. Um, you know, I think that um, probably Pool of Radiance probably sold four or five times as much as our next best game up to that time, uh, primarily on the Commodore 64, though uh, PC was still kind of up and coming, but that was our bread and butter with uh, was Commodore. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Pool of Radiance did well. Curse of the Azure Bonds did well. Seagull of Silver Blades did well. The Dragonlance ones did okay. Uh, and then we did some uh, external gold box games with Stormfront, uh, the gateway to the Savage Frontier and such. And the numbers started to drop at that time. So that's when we were starting to plan for the next generation of games. Uh, but we also had time to do the Buck Rogers games in the same engine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to talk about those. You know, one thing, I, I played all of them on the, my C64, but I couldn't play the, the Pools of Darkness. That's right. Yeah, so what what happened there? <laughs> it would have been great to be able to finish my party. Uh, yeah, uh, but the Commodore 64 had uh, steadily dropped, and the PC had steadily uh, risen in dominance. And so by the time Pools of Darkness came out, it was uh, not one of the platforms we uh, decided to support. Yeah, I, I remember there being a little controversy in house mm -hmm. about that. You know, there were a lot of people who did not want to abandon the the Commodore. But yeah, the numbers the numbers were not not very good at that point. Yeah, yeah. So I cl I clung to mine, yeah, you know, <laughs> way longer than I probably should have. But you know, those are the Treasures of the Savage Frontier. I think was the last one that I that I got for it. Mm -hmm. So what about these Buck Rogers games? I know you worked on... Oh, boy. I, yeah, I did a lot on those Buck Rogers games. Um, yeah, Buck Rogers was coming late in our development of uh, the Gold Box engine. Uh, head of TSR was uh, a Dilly. And the Dilly oh, is yeah, uh, her grandfather and uh, was the guy who created Buck Rogers, the comic strip in the, wow. in the newspapers. Uh, and so it was near and dear to her heart. And having TSR meant that she could uh, nudge us toward uh, expanding our systems to uh, to supporting Buck Rogers as well as D and D. And so that's what we did. Uh, and we had Flint, who was her brother, uh, come in, and uh, he was very hands-on on everything because it was uh, the family treasure. <laughs> I remember we had a whole lot of trouble getting Buck Rogers and Wilma Deering's uh, portraits approved. Uh, yeah. And uh, what was the trouble there? I could tell that story. You want me to tell that? Yeah, you story? can tell that story. Okay. Well, uh, that was that was my job doing a lot of the portraits, and um, so for Wilma Deering, who was supposed to be, I guess she's a colonel. You know, she's this. You know, tough military, you know, she's not supposed to look like a, a shrinking violet. Okay, so I uh, I did her with a, you know, a strong chin and a forthright look, and she's got this, uh, you know, space ray gun, whatever. And the word comes back, uh, she's not sexy enough. I want her sexy. Okay. Well, fine. So I, you know, I emphasize the, you know, and, you know, soften her chin, whatever. Who knows what he any particular person means by sexy. Okay, so it comes back, still not sexy enough. And then my boss made the minor mistake of mentioning that the, the word had been, oh, this was a woman artist doing it? Maybe you should give it to a man. And I said, okay, you want sexy. <laughs> and I went out and I got a magazine that had some pictures of Tracy Lords. <laughs> Tracy Lords. Okay. okay. Well, this wasn't. Yeah. 
the, this was after she went legit, and so, but at any rate, it was Tracy Lords, and I based the next portrait of Wilma off of Tracy Lords. So then the word comes back. That's a little too sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up putting together this this little animation in deluxe paint, just making fun of the whole process, and uh, just showed it to the art department. And then I guess somebody told Joel, and he came down the hall. Oh, I want to see this, <laughs> uh, dude. I'm kind of uh, um, setting up the entire development process here. Uh, you know, he stood there, all these all these managers standing around at the back of my queue watching me run this thing and don't mix paint. Luckily, they thought it was funny. <laughs> I don't know if I still have that thing around anymore. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask if you still had that. It's pretty cool. Okay, so just a couple last questions here, really. Sure. Uh, one, uh, you know, what did you think about the other uh, big role-playing game series, uh, Ultima, Wizardry, and the Might and Magics? Oh, I played most of them all the way through almost as soon as they came out. <laughs> so I was uh, a fan of most of them. Uh, I like some of the stuff with Ultima in terms of some of the character creation stuff, like with, I think it was Ultima 4, that you made a certain number of choices at the beginning, and uh, I thought that added a little bit more character and personality to, to what you were developing. Uh, and uh, I like Might and Magic's uh, combat and... Uh, just the way you could move through and, uh, you know, just a lot of the uh, abilities that you could do with your characters and such. So uh, that was one of my favorite series, I think, of the set. Uh, didn't play a huge amount of wizardry, um, but uh, I enjoyed what I did play. Um, it's always good to keep an eye on what other people are doing and <laughs> see what you can be inspired by. Yeah, you play sometimes play those games and think, oh, you know, why didn't we think of that? Or <laughs> we we <laughs> we're so much better than this. <laughs> yep, you can always say, okay, well, this section here, you know, we wouldn't do anything like that because uh, you know don't like it at all. Or, or ah. <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot of those guys started to have much bigger art budgets than ours, so they started to get a lot more spectacular. Mm -hmm. I was you know thinking about the last few SSI games, and, you know, Dark Sun, Shattered Lands, and you know, I was wondering to get your thoughts on that and why you think that you know, things were declining. Uh, well, I mean, there was a number of things going on at the time. I mean, Goldbox was definitely too old an engine to, to keep going. Our numbers were saying that. And so we had to decide how we wanted to uh, move from there. PC was doing okay numbers, but it didn't replace PC plus Commodore 64 plus everything else that we used to do. Um, and so the consoles were, were there, and so... Uh, we were looking into how we might do that. Uh, you guys didn't have anything to do with those uh, N Nintendo Dungeons and Dragons games, or uh, I didn't have anything to do with it. Uh, that was more um, Chuck and uh, I know Keith went over there a few times to Japan to uh, to look over their shoulders. The Pony Canyon stuff. Um, we ended up developing and starting to develop Dark Sun on on Nintendo in house. Uh, and we had done Buck Rogers on Sega Genesis uh, in association with Electronic Arts. So we'd done a little bit of, of stuff with that. But the big problem was that SSI as a publisher did not have so much funds that they could afford to purchase a bunch of console uh, cartridges from Japan, have them shipped over, have them sent out to stores, have the stores sell them, and then get around to giving us money. <laughs> so. That was causing Joel and uh, the, the business guys a lot of uh, headaches trying to figure out how they might break into that market, you know, where they could get the funds to float long enough to, to do it and what would happen if there was a misstep. Because, I mean, when we could, if we needed to ship another 10,000 units, uh, you know, it was just down, I, do, I would just had to drive down about 40 miles with a disc and... Uh, some some and then they they manufacture it and send it back in a truck and then we uh, yeah. then shipping would ship it out, um, having to go across there. Also, they also decided they wanted to diversify at the same time in terms of both a fantasy game and a science fiction game. Um, so they had developed a, a tools team to support both of them as well as a development team for both of them and. Uh, 
pool of darkness was pools of darkness was still not quite out. <laughs> so, and to move from the dark sun, move to dark sun from pool of uh, darkness and such with its nine month development cycle to what in that day and age was really to get an original product was an 18 month development cycle. And management wasn't willing to uh, assume that it was going to be 18 months, but they needed an 18 month development cycle product. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just all kind of squished up into this. Yeah. So uh, it all mixed together to be um, all, you know, basically the stuff was coming from every angle at that point for SSI. And uh, in the end, they had to cancel the science fiction game and just put the resources into Dark Sun. Um, they had to abandon the Nintendo project because they couldn't figure out how they could manufacture the cartridges. And uh, Paul got to move on to Panzer General, which was uh, uh, quite a feather in SSI's camp. So uh, he made out okay. And then uh, they had to essentially gut the internal development uh, teams Yep. And anybody who wasn't uh, on an external project ended up getting laid off at that point, and that was in 93. Yeah. And then uh, it wasn't too much longer after that that they uh, had to set up for their initial sale. And, and they moved up to Novato and changed owners many times before they uh, ceased being uh, a label even. so. Uh, That's kind of a sad It was. Sad ending. Yeah, when it was when it was cooking, it was it was cooking very well. Yeah, it was, it was uh, a good place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, How I mean, you it, feel when Baldur's Gate came out. Oh well, that was a nice uh, return to uh, that style of game again. Uh, it was there had been a dearth of it since uh, since the Gold Box, and I mean, Dark Sun had had it too, but. Uh, there weren't a lot of, of games in that ilk before then, and of course they took it up and did it up in the modern um, style. And uh, so it was great to see D and D back. It was great to uh, to play that kind of combat again with a lot of the party dynamics and so on, and a good long storyline. And uh, so, and you know, it was one of those times also where PC was quote dying or not dying and <laughs> all of that. So. Good to see a PC game out again. You know, I, was, I forgot to ask. I was just going to ask you briefly about the uh, Neverwinter Nights, the online or America Online. Okay, game. well, uh, product, yeah. Yeah, was uh, that? Hey. Did you work on that? I did not work on that. Uh, it was mostly done out of house. Uh, and, uh, I don't remember who was running it as producer. But uh, yeah, it was a, a launch into a you know a completely new style of game, and uh, it broke a lot of ground. I think that it was uh, kind of a little early, and uh, I don't know that AOL really was able to establish itself as a uh, a portal for games at all. So uh, uh, I think it was a very interesting product, but uh, I didn't have a much invo involvement in it. All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time out to chat with me. Oh, sure, our pleasure. It's really been fun. I mean, I could go on about these games all. <laughs> you know, you got <laughs> things to do. It's really exciting stuff. Hopefully, you get lots of uh, no, you know, no problems with the meeting the fun goal. I'm hoping so. Yeah, uh, hoping it's just so. a matter, I think, of uh, having people get uh, aware of it and. Uh, do you understand. know how much you're going to ask for yet? Uh, we're looking at um, four fifty, five hundred uh, thousand. Oh, that's not. It's uh, you know, it's I not. Figured a you need at least a million. Uh, well, I mean, we're hoping for much more. Uh, we can make uh, the basic game for that. Uh, we'd like, you know, if we had twenty million, I think we'd have too much money. <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> can you ever really? Yes, I, I, I wonder no, what. Yeah, uh, actually, I think yeah. Chris so Roberts. I'm wondering with his fifty-four Some million star citizen. With, uh, with, but uh, uh, yeah, did fantastic, didn't it? I think it'd, uh, it'd be interesting to see what they end up doing with it. I think there's a point where you know another million is you know, doesn't <laughs> yeah. make any difference. Some, <laughs> some responsibility. I think it ends up trying to making everything you know the com as the complexity increases. You get <laughs> <laughs> potential yeah. gap bugs yeah. and all that. 
It seems like there must be a point where adding more money is not going to give you a better game, right? Right, I think so. I think it's just more bells and whistles and... Uh, you know, when, it's one more thing to polish, and so it's one limited, more month you have to spend. When you have limited means, you have to work smart. <laughs> yeah, that's my opinion. Yeah. That's why, you know, with the 500000 and such, we've made um, the way we're doing the artwork is is simpler than, obviously, state-of-the-art could be uh, in terms of how we're going to do baked-in lighting, how we're going to uh, uh, do a number of other items in the um, in the style so i mean it, it's not going to be pixel art it's going to be good looking art but it's not going to be flashy as you can do and, a cga this time yeah cga we <laughs> yeah, really going to give you a blast of the past or that's well i mean people do it from time to time in indie stuff but, uh, you know obviously if we can get uh, north of uh, a million then we'll be a lot more comfortable in what we're doing but uh, we'll put something out for our minimum goal and uh you know, our, you know, my goal is really much to focus on design and uh, such like we did in the old days and try to, you know, keep the uh, cost down on the design and the artwork as much as, you know, doesn't disappoint uh, people. Well, I don't think it's, I'm really excited about it. I can't wait. How long do you think it'll take you to, uh, to finish it once you get the uh, Once funding? we go through Kickstarter, uh, we'll be moving into higher gear and we're looking at, Alpha around the end of 2015 and early 2016, we're looking at uh, doing a release. You're going to have a box box copies and yeah, and all? just to have a, a box copies. So that'll be one of the, the physical tiers, and we'll try to put uh, a number of things to harken back to the uh, SSI. Got to have an adventurer's journal. Oh yeah. Okay. I don't know what else would you put in there. Maybe a I guess a shirt, t-shirt, a uh, cloth map. Oh, yeah. Um, Cloth maps. Yeah, we're plotting a cloth map. I yeah. mean, those are always cute, and they seem to be uh, popular. So, mm -hmm. um, don't know about a T-shirt since, uh, you know. Well, I remember. I remember T-shirts all around the office. Yes, right? we always say that's that's all the programmers ever wore. I think was <laughs> the older the better. <laughs> you know, the the more holes around the collar, you know, the more cachet it had. Probably still have a T-shirt or two. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> well, you had the SSI T-shirts. Oh yeah, we had tons of T-shirts for those. Oh yeah, we handed them out for everything. Oh, everywhere I worked, everywhere I worked, all through the industry, you got T-shirts galore. Of course, they usually did them up in men's uh, extra large and extra extra large. Oh, sure. So I ended up having to wear them like dresses, <laughs> a pair of leggings. <laughs> Yeah, well, most of us were extra large. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, better to have too large and too small of a T-shirt, I guess. <laughs> Definitely looking forward to seeing your Kickstarter. Yeah, well, we'll let you know when it's coming up. And, uh, you know, we haven't settled on the day, but hopefully early October so that we don't end up uh, competing with Thanksgiving and Black, uh, Black Friday and everybody's Christmas releases. Mm. We thought about maybe doing it... Uh, Late September, and then we heard that Wasteland 2 moved to, you know, yesterday. <laughs> we didn't yeah. want to go anywhere near that. <laughs> no one would, uh, you no know. Be thinking about it, yeah. Right. So we're hoping that people will have uh, gotten enough Wasteland by the time they uh, see our Kickstarter to say that they'd love to see another game uh, come out in a year. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping it'll evangelize people to uh, the uh, advantages of turn-based combat and, uh that kind of big sprawling world. A lot of the Kickstarters I've, uh, you know what usually happens, you get a big splash right away mm -hmm. and then it sort of dies and then hopefully right at the end, you know, maybe you'll get the surge right. Yeah. <laughs> very stressful from what I've Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be very yeah. stressful, I know. Oh, so, uh, but, you know, I always figured I wanted to try one at least because uh, I thought it was an interesting dynamic uh, and a way to interact with people in a, in a different way. I mean, I prefer just to handle uh, design issues and such, but working with uh, the public and promotional stuff's uh, a bit new to me, and uh, it's, a, it's a good, interesting experience, uh, kind of a different perspective on the whole games thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Would you be willing to change things if you got a, heard enough outcry from the Kickstarter oh, yeah. folks? We'll obviously have to balance out between uh, what people uh, can suggest and, you know, what what they probably will want in the final product, uh, you know, it's, uh, 
interacting with uh, the audiences, uh, it's always a uh, interesting dynamic. And, uh, you know, as long as you don't switch to real time combat. Oh, that's definitely you know, <laughs> we're uh, it's the one thing we're definitely uh, fixed on just because the experience that you get with it. But, uh, none of us are really huge hand-eye coordination guys. <laughs> so, last time we want, last thing we want to do is do an act RPG. <laughs> yeah, we've like got enough play. of those. <laughs> and that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I will hopefully be back. Uh, probably not next week. I've got a conference in Tampa to go to, but uh, certainly the week after I'll be back and I'll see what I can do. But uh, chances are it'll be two weeks before you see another match yet, so uh, hang in there. As always, guys, I want to thank you so much for your support of the show. You know, it really means a lot to me, guys. I don't know if you necessarily know that, but uh, this makes a huge difference, and I really, really appreciate that. Uh, plus, you know, it gives you access to some... A podcast and some Google Air Hangouts. Those are always a blast. And believe me, <laughs> everybody loves those. Uh, love to see you there. So if you'd like to support the show, remember you could do it at any level. If you got a buck uh, for an episode, two, three bucks, five, uh, whatever you're comfortable with, whatever you think the show is worth to you guys. No amount's too small. I appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you again for that. All right, the news from the Matt Cave. Well, obviously, the biggest news is that the Seven Dragons Saga Kickstarter is now live. That's right. Just went up a couple days ago, and it looks like they could uh, use all the help they can get. I hate to say that. Um, you know, and there are some theories out there. Uh, but anyway, I think the problem is just not enough people have heard about it. It's honestly what I think. Uh, so I'm telling you about it now. Uh, go take a look in the links. You'll see the link to the Seven, Seven Dragon Saga. Uh, go check it out. Watch the video. Look at those awesome uh, pledge rewards. They even got a, uh, a hilarious uh, a printed uh, code wheel <laughs> that goes with the game. I thought that was an excellent touch. Uh, but anyway, I think it looks, you know, <laughs> you know what can I see? Uh, just go look at the pitch video and uh, uh, make a pledge to that. Uh, just keep in mind, it is uh, the footage they're showing there. Um, in that video is preliminary footage, so don't jump to too many conclusions <laughs> like yours truly did. Uh, anyway, go check it out. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Uh, uh, some very unfortunate news for fans of the Discworld series. Author Terry Pratchett has passed away. Now, I've got to say, I'm sort of familiar with his work through other people. A lot of my friends uh, talk about, rave about those books. I personally haven't read them, um, so, <laughs> you know, that is what it is. I guess I should pick those up. Maybe actually this would be a good time. If you folks are fans of the series, you know, let me know what would be a good place to start uh, with that. Uh, okay, what else? Also, Obsidian, there's a little article up that I thought was interesting talking about how the, the uh, Project Eternity Kickstarter basically saved Obsidian's bacon. Uh, I didn't realize this, and the author didn't realize this, but apparently they were just, you know, just about ready to close the doors, and this uh, Kickstarter really just saved the day. Uh, so anyway, you can go read about that. Uh, pretty interesting stuff. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, a bit of a personal news. So as you know, I've got this book, uh, Vintage Games. Uh, this came out back in 2009, and I've been uh, contracted to do a second edition of this book, an, an updated form, and I've been working on that uh, pretty much uh, all week long, and it's basically almost a complete rewrite. I mean, some of the material will be the same, but Going back in, totally changed the format, so instead of having that alphabetical order by game, it'll be just a regular story starting at the you know beginnings with Space War and Pong, all the way up into modern times. And uh, unlike that book, you know, when we wrote that, I, had, I didn't even have Match Hat out yet. So I've got all those interviews I've done with so many people and working in all of those stories and quotations and things and a lot, a lot more stuff. And I think it's just going to be a better written book all around. So I'm really excited. I got a couple chapters of it uh, done already, and uh, I mean, to me, it just re it makes, you know, it's a hundred times better. So I'm really uh, excited about that. I wish I could just uh, share it with you as I write it, but, you know, unfortunately, I have to keep it all under wraps until uh, until it's published. But anyway, I just thought I'd give you guys an update on that. 
uh, Vintage Games 2.0 should be available. It's going to be a while, but uh, I'll try to keep you posted uh, um, with updates. All right. Ah, man, what a week. You know what would make this week a lot better? An ale. All right, so this time I've got a Rush River Imperial India Pale Ale. Uh, this is ale brewed with honey. Love honey. And <laughs> I guess it might work with the uh, ale. We'll see. Unfiltered, unpasteurized, double bubble uh, alcohol. 9% by volume. So that is actually quite... I'm actually kind of... Yeah, 9%. I'm very shocked it's that strong. <laughs> wow, you know, that is uh, quite potent. Usually don't see that strength in a six-pack. Uh, so I'm going to have to be very careful with this. Uh, let's see, anything else on here about the brewery? Let's see, Brewing Company, River Falls, Wisconsin. They're, so they're out of Wisconsin, uh, just one state away from me. I know some of you guys say you're having a hard time finding these these ales, but you know, I don't know what I can do about that. You know, it's, uh, I'm sorry if you have a hard time finding them. It's just kind of luck of the draw what I happen to have access to here. Uh, this is a small batch series, it says, so I guess that even decreases the odds uh, even further that you might find this, but, you know, I guess it is what it is. Uh, so anyway, let me get that open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this Imperial India Pale Ale here in this rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> I've been smelling, I mean, it just smells like a like an air freshener, you know, it's really good. You got that sort of clover, sort of honey flavors there, or aromas. Just a really nice, uh, I mean, if this smells anywhere as good as the, uh, I mean, if it tastes, I think I'm getting some of the fumes. <laughs> if it tastes as good as it smells, I think I'm in for a real treat here. Anyway, let's give it a taste. A little bit of a, a bitterness. It's got a kind of a grassy like uh, taste of that. Um, all sorts of flavors going on. It's just really kind of hard to uh, fixate on one. It's a, a lot going on on the palate here. Now let me give it another taste. You get sort of a, a cherry, uh, chocolatey taste there. You can definitely taste some of the hops. Not as sweet as I would have expected with the, with the honey. Not really getting a lot of a sweetness, but just kind of a bitter, uh, not bitter enough to be unpleasant, but definitely it's a little bitterness there, a little bit of a chocolatey-like uh, flavor. Uh, let me try it one more time here. It's kind of a chocolate cherries and maybe some mild uh, sort of coffee flavors to this. It's uh, not bad, but I'm I'm kind of surprised. It smells a lot different than it than it tastes actually. Uh, but it is a, an India, India pale ale, uh, so I guess they didn't get carried away with the honey. So that that's a good thing. Anyway, I'm not gonna I'm not you know I'll give it one more taste. Yeah, you know it's not bad. It's uh, considering it's got nine percent alcohol. I was kind of uh, worried that this would just be you know hard to hard to drink, but it's actually quite a smooth. Uh, which is uh, nice, but uh, you know, again, with that high of a level, you really have to watch yourself, not not drink it too too much of it or too fast. But anyway, it's it's it's. Uh, I'm having a hard time deciding on this. I guess I'm going to go four out of five drinking horns on this. I'm I'm very close to a five. It's just it's almost there, but I'm thinking maybe uh, with a four this time. But anyway, it's the Imperial India Pale Ale, uh, Rush River. <laughs> if I have another one, I'd probably be giving it six or seven horns. Uh, so let's uh, <laughs> let's stop there. All right, so I was looking for quotations about dragons, and I found a really fun one from Alexander Dumas. Dumas? Dumas? I don't know. Uh, anyway, the author of the Three Musketeers series, one of my favorites from uh, my childhood. It goes something like this. Happiness is like those places in fairy tales whose gates are guarded by dragons. We must fight in order to conquer it. See you guys in uh, two weeks.
Your mother was a hamster, and your father smelt 